over the next couple weeks, we're unpacking what is unique about Heritage Church. Who are we as a church, and, and what is it that we're striving to be? And to do that, uh, I pray that this helps us understand uh, not just what Heritage and who Heritage is, but who, who God has called His church to be. And, and if you uh, have... If you've been around for a little while, then, then what we're looking at and talking about today will sound pretty familiar, and it's going to be a great reminder for all of us. But if you've joined us in the last 12 to 24 months, uh, my, my hope is that you would understand why we do what we do and who we are striving to be as a church. And so you'll see it on the banner in our lobby. You'll see it here on the screen here. Uh, but this is, this is something you'll hear constantly at Heritage Church. Everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect. But we believe that with God, anything is possible. And, and so this week, we're, we're starting up here with everybody's welcome. We're, we're looking at this idea. You know, the fascinating thing about Jesus is that he was closer to God than anyone who ever lived. In fact, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. This was his claim to divinity. This was his claim saying, I am God in the flesh. It's, it's ultimately what got him murdered uh, by the people of his day. He, his claim to be God, he is God. He's the closest thing to God that ever walked the face of the earth because he is God. And yet people who were the farthest from God wanted to be around Jesus the most. People who agreed with Jesus the least wanted to be around him the most. People who were farthest from his lifestyle wanted to be closest to his life. And people who were the ungodliest of people wanted to be around the godliest man who had ever lived. It's kind of fascinating if you think about it. And when the church comes along, it, the same thing happens. The exact same thing in, in the book of Acts. We see in the New Testament the church uh, being born, this new little church in Jerusalem. And, and we looked at it last week in Acts 2. It says, they were enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. In other words... People are coming around the church and they're like, man, I had no idea Jesus changed so much. I, I don't even know what's going on. I don't, I don't even know if I agree with all of this, but I'm, but I'm in. And I want to know more. And if you were to simplify the why we do what we do here at Heritage, it would boil down to this. We believe that people matter to God. What people matter to God? All people. How much do they matter to God? More than you could possibly imagine. And so people matter to us. In fact, you, you and I mattered so much to God that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die on our behalf, to pay the sin debt that we owed but couldn't afford to pay on our own. And because people matter to God, people matter to us. And you say, well, what, what people matter? All people matter. How much do they matter? More than you can possibly imagine. We are a church with a mission to help people find and follow Jesus. We are a church seeking out, not perfectly, but seeking out that which is lost, those who are lost, that they would be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's why Jesus had to work really hard to teach people this. Because it's not something that comes naturally. It's not something that's easy for us. In fact, especially those that considered them really, themselves really religious and the closest to God, Jesus had the hardest time convincing them about this reality that people matter. All people matter more than you could possibly imagine. In fact, one of the foundational aspects of life and the whole discipline of sociology has been built on, uh, for humanity, is built on this idea that we are tribal creatures. All of sociology kind of starts with this foundation. It's not a bad thing. God created us this way. But when sin enters the world, we started using this tribalness to divide. And we started making a division line between us and them. And so I've got a couple stanchions here to kind of illustrate the idea, because most of you if, you, if you come regularly, you kind of sit in the same spots. My, my, my man Dustin here, he's always sitting up front with me. And you, you know, Sheridans are always here in the front row with their, with their crew. And, and, you know, sometimes in life we just we kind of live with this idea, this mentality. And it's not going to go all the way down the line. But, you know, we're just us and them, you know, or, uh, or us and, and them over there. And, and, and this is what life tends to become that, that well, if you don't think like me, if you don't vote like me, 
we begin to divide each other into different groups. And our self-esteem, our sense of identity, all gets wrapped up in the us and the them. We have a propensity to do this with all sorts of things, whether it's sports. Where are my uh, Packers fans at? All right. All right. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like you should come over to this side. Where are my Bears fans at? Yeah. And if you're somebody else, if you cheer for something else, then, well, good for you. Um, we do it with sports. We do it with race. We do it with politics. We do it with culture and gender and sexuality and wealth and education. And, and if we're honest, we even do it within the church. With religion and spirituality and leads, leads to an important question, you know, when it comes to God, who's the in group? Who's the in when it comes to God, who, who's the us and who's the them? Think about the last few years. And think about who you've lost in the last few years. And, I, and I'm not talking about who you've lost to, uh, to illness or to medical compl- complications, but who have you lost because of your politics? Who have you lost because of a social uh, issue? Who have you lost? We're, we're in an election year. Who are you in tension with because of what news channel you watch and they watch? Is it a friend, a family, a coworker, a neighbor, a sibling? Who are you no longer in relationship with or who, who, who do you have a tense relationship with that's so palpable Whenever you're together, because you've drawn a line between us and them, because you've made a division, which people does God identify with? What kind of music does God like? Does he like it loud or does he like it quiet? Does he like it new or does he like it old? What what language does God speak? God made us in his image, but we all tend to try to remake him into our own image. We tend to think that, well, what I like is obviously what God likes. And what I think is obviously what God must think. Let me help uh, correct this, this fractured view. People matter to God. What people? All people. How much do they matter? More than you can possibly imagine. This is the message Jesus came to teach us, even if it killed him. It's why Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, while we were far from him, while we were the thems, Christ died for us. While we we wanted nothing to do with him, he showed us his love. When, When we let our tribalness divide us, we lose God's heart for the bigger tribe of humanity that he came to save. As you follow the life, as you follow the message and the ministry of Jesus, what you see is that the community that he began to build was marked by this message, everyone's welcome. So today we're going to look at one encounter where, where we see this happen, where Jesus begins calling his disciples, and we see him call fishermen, and we see him call these radical extremists and, and, and tax collectors, and what we're going to see with this encounter in Matthew chapter 9, is at least three reasons why everyone is welcome. At least three reasons that in this story we see that everyone is welcome at the table with Jesus. If you've got your Bible, turn to Matthew 9. We're going we're gonna to jump in here. Matthew is authoring this gospel. He's recounting uh, his experience with Jesus. He sets the stage and shows us the heart of Jesus Jesus had just finished healing a paralyzed man in his own hometown. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Jesus passed on from there. And he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. Now in that day, a rabbi and a tax collector would have been about as us versus them as you could get. 
They didn't, they didn't talk. They didn't interact. It was like you just avoid each other at all costs. I mean, the start of this, Jesus is passing from there, uh, and he sees uh, uh, Matthew, a tax collector at his tax booth. It sounds like the beginning of a bad joke back then. Uh, a rabbi and a uh, tax collector walk into a bar and, right? Like a tax collector back then is, was, is quite different than the IRS agents today that are thought of so highly, Right? All right, good, you got it. You're, you're still with me. Uh, a little backstory. See, in the first century Israel, the, po- the political landscape of Israel was this tinderbox. It was just waiting to explode. It was waiting to blow up. Uh, not long after Jesus' death and his resurrection, this whole Israel just exploded. Politically, socially, economically, it just goes crazy. It went to war, rebellion, Jerusalem's destroyed. Not only that, but the Jews uh, in that day were living under this immense oppression economically. Most historians believe that the tax rate in in Jesus' day could have been as high as 80 or 90%. I mean, can you imagine? Well, we're getting there, right? Can you imagine? I kind of can now. So you have Matthew, a social outcast, as a Jewish person making a good living off of oppressing his own people. This is why tax collectors were so hated. Because many of them, most of them were Jews who kind of switched sides. And and they turned their back on their own people and they joined the Roman occupation and they start taxing their own people. And, And tax collectors made their living by adding an extra fee to the already high tax rate. And so however they wanted to get paid, they just add a little bit more. And they had the whole Roman army behind them as as kind of the muscle. So they would cheat and oppress their own people to enrich Rome and to enrich themselves. And so you can imagine the hatred that Israel would have for tax collectors like Matthew. It's why tax collectors weren't allowed to vote in, in Jewish courts or testify in Jewish courts. They were at the bottom of the social ladder. They were listed with the beasts and the unclean things. They were often associated as tax collectors and sinners. And sinners in that day was code for sex workers. That's who these people are. That's who Jesus, we often see him hanging out with. So a person devoted to God, a rabbi, like Jesus, would never address, would never eat, would never touch, or even look at someone so unclean and evil. And yet Jesus is walking by with a few of his disciples, like Peter, James, and John, fishermen, not really at the top of the spiritual or social uh, totem pole, but at least they weren't a tax collector, you know? Kind of an us versus them. At least I'm not that bad. And Jesus sees a tax collector, and he stops. And his followers, his disciples, they wait for Jesus to say what most rabbis would say. Hey, my disciples, Peter, James, John, you guys, look at this tax collector. This is what a life apart from God looks like. Stay away from being like this guy. They're waiting for this moment, but it doesn't come. Instead of doing that, Jesus stuns them all as he actually walks up to Matthew, looks him in the eye, and says two words that will change Matthew's life forever. He says, follow me. Follow me. Here's here's the first thing. We we know everyone's welcome because even Jesus invites the least likely. What Jesus is saying here is, what he's not saying is, hey, let's play a little game of follow the leader. Come on, let's go skip through town. Come follow me. He's not saying that. He's saying, I see you, I know you, and I want you. I see your past. I see your mistakes. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want you on my team. And everybody watching is stunned. Matthew's got to be speechless. He he wasn't getting offers from rabbis to be, you know, a disciple on a regular basis. It would be like going into prison and asking someone in prison, hey, you want to be the governor? Well, maybe in Illinois, that's not a great example either. (laughs) What Jesus does here is scandalous. What Jesus does here is unprecedented. It's head scratching. It's like, really? It's unexplainable grace, which, by the way, is how any one of us get connected to God. Now, if the 
If that little crowd watching is amazed by what Jesus does, they're even more stunned by what happens next. Everybody's watching Matthew's response. What's he going to do? They're thinking, this man, this is going to be good, guys. The rabbi just invited the tax collector. I mean, Matthew's going to, like, laugh in his face. I mean, this Roman-loving, Israel-cheating, tax-collecting guy, nobody goes into that business and then, like, decides to change careers and go be a disciple. He's probably going to laugh at Jesus and probably audit him. Watch, watch what happens next, right? Instead, we're told that he rose and followed Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. No other words are exchanged. Matthew just gets up and he's like, let's go. Uh, And he just starts following him. Two words again with great meaning. Following Jesus. Listen, following Jesus is not a prayer that you pray. Following Jesus is not going to church every once in a while uh, throughout the month. Following Jesus isn't the occasional post that you make on social media. Uh, Following Jesus is death to myself so that I can live for Christ. Following Jesus is I'm stepping down off of the throne of my life. The CEO position of my life, yeah, I I release that so, so there's room for Jesus to sit there and lead and guide me. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus, to surrender all of yourself and and live completely to him. And that's what Matthew does. He left his tax collecting booth. He left everything. He left his past, his self-image, his identity, his pride. It doesn't even tell us that Matthew says anything. He just gets up and walks away from his job as if this is what he's been waiting for his whole life. What is it that you have left behind? Follow Jesus. What is it that you've walked away from to give all of yourself to Jesus? What will you do with the invitation that Jesus has for you? Because the same invitation that he has for Matthew, follow me, is the same invitation for every single one of us in this room. Jesus is saying, follow me. Step off the throne of your life and let me lead and guide you. What will you do with that invitation See, don't miss this. It turns out Matthew, the one person that everyone thought was the most unlikely candidate to follow Jesus, was just one ask away from the kingdom of God. Matthew was just one ask away from a life with Jesus. Here's the thing. You never know who's just one ask away. So what if you started inviting people? What if you started extending the invitation that Jesus extends and, hey, come follow Jesus. Come find the hope that your heart is longing for. Come find who he is. Surrender your life to him. Because the heart of God is that which seeks those who are lost and calls them to a relationship with himself. But here's the thing. The story doesn't end there. It actually gets a little bit more strange. Matthew has this idea. He gets connected to Jesus. He loves Jesus. And, and like Jesus took a chance on me. And Matthew gets this crazy idea. He says to himself, I got a bunch of friends. And yeah, they're a little bit rough around the edges. I mean, they're tax collectors and sinners. And they haven't been to church in a long time. But I, th- I think they'd really like this Jesus guy. And so he has this crazy idea. I'm going to throw a party. And I've got, I've got this big house from all my tax collecting days. And, you know, I, I'll buy all the food and the party supplies and the drinks. And we'll throw a party. If I can just get my friends to meet Jesus, I think, I think they might like him. If I can just get him in the same room. And so, so that's what he does. Understand the people on, on Matthew's guest list, they, they weren't getting invited to dinners and parties with a rabbi on a regular basis. Matthew sends out the invites. The, the, it tells us that it works because in verse 10 it says, And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. We don't get the backstory as much as Jesus says, Follow me. Matthew gets up and follows, and the next thing we know, they're all at a party at Matthew's house. Jesus reclining at the table, relaxing and eating with these sinners and tax collectors. We know everyone's welcome because here's the thing. Our lifestyle does not stop Jesus from wanting to be with us. 
let that reality sink in a little bit. Your lifestyle doesn't stop Jesus from wanting to be with you. But make no mistake, while Jesus will meet you where you're at, while he loves you uh, and, and wants to see you move from where you are to following him, make no mistake, he doesn't want to leave you that way. He loves you far too much to let you stay in that sin pattern, in that destructive behavior. He loves you way too much to stay in that space. And so he calls you to follow him and allow your life to be changed and transformed by his grace and his forgiveness. We know everybody is welcome because your lifestyle doesn't stop Jesus from wanting to be with you. I don't know about you, I'd love to know what that party was like with Jesus and Matthew and all of the sinners and tax collectors. Like, what were they talking about? And the Bible doesn't really tell us. I, I've got to imagine, because I hear it quite often, I'll walk into a room when, in the middle of an off-color joke, and, oh, I, I, you know, I can't tell the punchline. Pastor's here, right? Or I hear it quite often, you know, uh, colorful language or different things. And, oh, sorry, Pastor. Or I'll meet someone new for the first time and, you know, we'll be talking, they'll be, they'll be joking around and, and, and then they find out like, oh, you're a pastor? Yeah, I'm so sorry. And, you know, and because they've been cussing for the last hour or something and it's like, look, look, don't change on my behalf, like just be who you are, right? And I've got to imagine that the phrase was thrown out quite often uh, at this dinner with Jesus as each time uh, a colorful uh, story or language is shared, uh, Rabbi, sorry. And I just imagine whether that's what happened or not. I don't know. I just sometimes go down those rabbit holes as I'm reading the Bible. Whether that's what happened or not, I, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure Jesus was sitting there smiling, loving these people who, who were so far from him, spiritually speaking. And the disciples are watching with their mouths like on the ground, like, what is going on? And apparently some other people are watching as well. A party like this would have drawn spectators. Groups are outside of the house looking through the windows and kind of surrounding and trying to get a glimpse and see what's going on. Uh, those that are closest to God, those who are the spiritual leaders of the day, the in-group, if you will, they're, they're watching and they couldn't figure out what's going on. And as we continue in the story, it says, in verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, the religious leaders of the day, they're outside looking on at this Jesus hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors, And they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and with sinners? Why is he doing this? But when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need for a physician but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but the sinner. I love this part of the story. And if you pay close enough attention, Matthew tells us the Pharisees don't ask Jesus, why are you doing this? The Pharisees ask Jesus' disciples, why, why does he do this? Jesus overhears it, and, and it's like Jesus is like, wait, 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 let me, let me answer. Let me answer. I know this one. My disciples, they're still in like kingdom 101. I've got the answer. Let me, let me tell you why I came. Because it's not why you think. Those who are well have no need for a physician but those who are sick. I came for the sick. I came for those who are far from me, not those who didn't think they needed me in the first place. See, Jesus didn't go to these people because they welcomed him warmly. He went to them because they needed him greatly. Jesus welcomes everyone because the truth is, is everyone needs him. Your past does not disqualify you from coming to Jesus. In fact, your past is probably evidence that you need him just like I do. God doesn't divide the human race into us and into them. Jesus is saying, my father wants everyone to be us. He loves everyone more than you can possibly imagine I didn't come for people who are already connected to me. I came to help those who are far from me. I'm here for people who have gotten disconnected from God. See, Jesus loves the Pharisees too. 
That's why every interaction he has with them, he's calling them out and calling them to understand the heart of God. He even tells them, go learn what this means. You spiritually, like, corrupt people. You think you know what it's like to be connected to God, but you couldn't be further from the truth. Go learn what it means to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is constantly pointing out to the Pharisees the heart of God and what it's like, how religion and spirituality, when wrongly understood or pursued, it causes great human misery and rebellion from God. And so over and over, Jesus tells us what God's heart is like, that he chases down the one and leaves the 99, that he turns the house upside down to look for the one lost coin, that he throws a party when the son comes home who had wandered This is the good news that Jesus came to bring. This is who Jesus is, a man who by any means is welcoming the sinners to come. Why would he do that? Because he couldn't not do it. Because people matter. All people matter. So much so that Jesus would give his own life. Jesus welcomed people that other rabbis and other people in society uh, would refuse to even talk to. He welcomes Roman centurions, adulterous women, lepers and prostitutes, Gentiles and cheats, demon-possessed people. And while Jesus is hanging on the cross and dying, he even invites a thief. This is the foundation of the church. This is who we are as Heritage Church. The body of Jesus here on earth. So who's welcome? Who's welcome here at Heritage? Everybody. Believers and unbelievers. Skeptics and mockers. Republicans and Democrats. Old people and young people. People in suits and people in jeans. People with wrinkly skin. People with tattooed skin people with wrinkly and tattooed skin, (laughs) people with all colored skin, people with every language, people that are respectable, people that are uh, less than respectable, skeptics, shady people, addicted people, married people, divorced people, messed up people, gay people, straight people, confused people. Everyone. Everyone is welcome at the table of Christ. Church, look around. Look around. Welcome, look around. Welcome to Matthew's party. Amen. Matthew's encounter with Jesus shows us how much God cares for the wholeness of someone's life, not just the perfection of their attempt at worship. And so he continues to break down the walls and the barriers. There is no us and them. All are welcome. He wants to radically change your life. He wants to rescue you from your sin. He wants to invite you to a life of purpose where you're never the same again. Here's the truth. At Heritage, we're just a bunch of messed up people. So if you're perfect, go find another church. Because Heritage is, Heritage is for messed up people. The only difference is we're messed up people that have met Jesus. And we're striving after him. And we're seeking after him to become more like him. And as he reveals to us the corner of our heart that we're still sitting on the throne of, oh, missed that one. I'm going to step off. Jesus, you take it. You lead. You have your way. See, when you meet Jesus, it's not like you just go from us to them or or from them to us, but we realize that there is no us and them. We get to invite our friends, and Jesus begins to make it a party. My prayer for all of us at Heritage, especially if you call this church your home, is that our prayer would be, God, God, give me 
a heart like your son, Jesus. Give me eyes to see people like Jesus saw people. Broken and lost, hurting, maybe just one ask away, one invitation away. Help me see those around me that I walk past during the day, that I wait in the pickup line with other families. Help me see people through your eyes. Give me a heart to invite them to meet Jesus. As a church, I'm asking that when we gather together, as you serve here, as you uh, attend here, throughout your day, wherever you go, whoever you come across, will you go throughout your day like Jesus did, with a big everyone's welcome sign on your face? With, without the scoffing, the shoulder shrugging, the eye rolling, because of someone's chosen lifestyle or habits or decisions. Because to Jesus, that person still matters. How much do they matter? More than we can possibly imagine, right? What if you were to look around, cross the aisle, sit in a new seat, shake a new hand, welcome and engage with those who attend here or walk in for the very first time. You see somebody that you don't recognize, go introduce yourself because it takes immense courage for someone to walk through these doors for the very first time. But what if we saw them like Jesus sees them? That they matter, that they're loved. Invite someone to dinner. Refuse to stay seated and get up and engage. Get out of your comfort zone. Move from a place of being unknown to being known in your life. Take the next step. If you call Heritage Church your home, if you call Barrington your campus, call Lake Zurich your campus, would you ask God to give you a heart like Jesus? Today, would you say, I mean, would you raise your hand and say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm part of the search team. I want to live on mission. I want to follow your example to help people find and follow Jesus. If you're new to Heritage or if you haven't been here for a while, when you walk around your community, I hope I hope that people will discover that this is the place where everyone's welcome. Because nobody's perfect. But we do believe that with God, anything is possible. Pray with me. God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for the truth of your word that, that's challenging, that reminds us of your heart, and begins to strip away some of our preconceived ideas, our selfishness, our pride, to be reminded that this is not about us, that this church isn't about us, that we are simply a people and a place called by you to help people find and follow you. So God, if we have been distracted from that mission, we've lost sight of it, if we've been walking with other priorities, I pray today that you would grab hold of our hearts. That we would receive the invitation to follow you. And if you know Jesus and you've called yourself a Christian, and maybe today is the day for you to re recommit to the mission that he's called you to. And maybe you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. But that invitation is open to you today. Jesus is calling you to say, come and follow me. And for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, 
you're ready to, like Matthew, to just get up and start following him. To surrender your heart, to surrender your agenda, to surrender your life, to step off the throne and let King Jesus lead. If that's you, I encourage you to mark this moment with a prayer right now and say, Jesus, I need you. I've been doing life on my own terms and it hasn't provided what I've been searching for. So I confess my brokenness and my sin. And today I turn away from it and I surrender my life completely to you. Lead me and guide me. In Jesus' name, amen.